because flooding happens. When I talk about um, the environmental impact in Southeast Raleigh, we acknowledge climate change exists, no question. And climate change is not our biggest issue right now. What our biggest issue is, is what I call non-climate stressors. This is the development of property in this 46 square mile watershed. Because whenever buildings go up and pavement goes over ground, that means that water is not soaked into the ground and comes right past uh, my church, St. Ambrose. And I've been here 11 years, and just by eyeballing, I can see that the standing water level is moving closer and closer to St. Ambrose, which is built in the floodplain. Not because we wanted to build in the floodplain, but because when we approached the city in the 60s about building a church in this new black community, uh, they said, if you want to build, you have to build here, and pointed to the map. And we said, okay, that's, that's where um, we will build. And so. Welcome, everybody, to another wonderful episode of the Heartwood Podcast. Uh, I'm your host, Dr. Thomas Richard Easley, a.k.a. the Hip Hop Forester. And, of course, I'm here with my friend, co-host, Mr. Ben Galupo. Glad, we both, um, glad to have him here representing still, you know, the Yale School of the Environment. And today... We have the wonderful fortune of talking to an individual who is not just a leader in our community, but I'm proud that I can say that he's a friend of mine. Uh, and uh, we're going to go into, a, I think, some of his history, not a lot, because we it's, it's, it's too it's too much. We, we, we don't have enough time. Okay. But I want to talk to this, in, this individual. He's a native, okay, of uh, North Carolina. He is the uh, 11th rector of St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, which is based here in Raleigh, North Carolina. And some may even say a little bit more specifically in Southeast Raleigh, North, North Carolina. Um, he is an engineer. He is, uh, uh, as I would say, just to get, I'll just kind of take to my faith walk. He's a, he, he's a great man of God, as we would say. And, uh, and I'm definitely saying that. And I'm talking about none other than the Reverend Robert Jamal Taylor. Uh, uh, we are also known as Father Taylor, and I fortunately know him as Javon. So, my friend, brother, and father, how are you doing today? I'm doing well, and an honor to be uh, on this podcast, an honor to to spend time with you to talk about any number of things. So, thank you for the invitation. Yeah, sir. Look, we, it's a lot we could talk about. We could talk about. Uh, your martial arts background. We could talk about your engineer background. We could talk about your musical background. I mean, it's it's so much, man, that we can talk about in addition to your religious and uh, you know a background too. But you uh, you you honor us by being here on a podcast, and I just want to, you know, we've already talked about this, but because people are listening, I want them to know on our podcast we talk to uh, people, individuals, and if we're fortunate, you know, uh, able to talk to leaders within communities right now, where, wherever they are, and these leaders are either they could be infusing diversity, equity, and inclusion just as in access these principles in their work, or they could just be individuals who are bringing fairness, uh, who are bringing equity, and really uh, and dealing with justice, you know, in, in their line of work. And so, Father Taylor, uh, we we uh, are, like I said, honored to have you here. So it was good, you know, you and I, you know, have recently re reconnected here, uh, you know, back, of course, I guess, post-pandemic. And um, uh, and it was so good to see you, man. It was a blessing to see you. And you had just come back from your sabbatical. Now, everyone listening, yeah. this brother needed it, I'm sure, a long time ago before he got it. <laughs> okay. But he had just finished going to parts of the world. And, you know, if he wants to talk about that, he will. I want to put, you know, our business out there. But I'm just saying the blessing it was to see you. You, you looked up. Uh, Fresh, and I got to sit uh, back in, uh, you know, as technically part of the congregation and go through a midday service. And so, really, it was a blessing to be there. And I'm using those terms uh, freely here because I'm talking mm -hmm. to my brother here online. Yep. And so, with that, you then gave me a tour of the campus. And that's what it is. Everyone is a campus, it's not just a church, it's a campus. And uh, from there, he explained a lot of changes that we're going to talk about today. But then you took me on a journey, man, like a trip through the community. And then we ended up at the Walnut Wetland um, Creek Center. Uh, or, or we didn't end up there, but, you know, not far from it. So with that, I just kind of wanted to set that up so everyone understands that I was so excited to see you. I learned a lot from you that day. I learned a lot from you every time I talked to you. But that's kind of like the... I'll say the genesis for having my friend here on the, on the, um, on the podcast. So that that's why uh, the following questions will kind of come based on, you know, that. Okay. 
Now, here's the thing. I am not a part of the Episcopal you know, branch of the Christian church, but I am in, I am an ordained minister and uh, primarily in the United Church of Christ. And so uh, what I also know is that I have an understanding that those of us who are either pastors, I'm former pastor now, nothing bad happened. I just got a new job and had to leave. Uh, but uh, those of us who are pastors or in your case, definitely pastor, but father or rector uh, that, you know, this isn't a job or like an occupation. I mean, yeah, there's some, you know, provisions made through some, you know, doing it for fortunate for that, but it's, this is what oh, I'm yeah. calling, you know, like you are called to this. Oh, and so that's why I said we wanted to be open and make sure that we're welcoming yeah. many parts into the podcast today by starting the question, my service, will you share parts of your path that led you to St. Ambrose Episcopal Church as their rector? Thanks so much. That's, that's a good question. Um, I remember being seven years old when a high school senior came up to me and said, you're going to be a minister one day. And it scared the daylights out of me. And my first thought as a seven-year-old was, I don't want to be a minister because ministers have bad kids. I want to have kids one day and I don't want bad kids. So looking back, it's amazing how a seven-year-old's mind thinks, but that that was my thought. Um, so there's there's always been this yearning or longing in me to serve people or humanity in a different way. Uh, in the Christian tradition and in other spiritual traditions, we talk about calling, which for people who are not people of faith sounds esoteric. Um, I explain it as making a difference or impact to humanity in a different way. Uh, so there, there's always been this longing to, to, to uh, make the world a better place, as it were. And so as, as I grew up, went through high school and college, again, there's always something in the back of my mind about uh, being a minister. So um, I'm trained as an engineer, so trained in theology, but also as an engineer. So uh, with undergrad and graduate degrees in mechanical engineering, and I got to be a mechanical engineer uh, really through my father. So like many young people went through through these different phases of uh, wanting to be an astronaut when I was a kid. And then I remember watching the space shuttle Challenger explode while sitting in the classroom. And then I didn't want to be an astronaut anymore. So then I wanted to be um, a neurosurgeon. And then I found out that it took 12 years of college and I didn't want to start back in kindergarten and go back through high school. They just seemed like a lot. But when I was in uh, eighth grade, my father told me a story about a black man named Elijah McCoy, who was for, uh, a son of enslaved people um, in Kentucky. And he wanted to be an engineer. But because of racism and white supremacy, could not do that in the United States. He goes to Edinburgh, Scotland, gets a degree in engineering, comes back to the United States, um, wants to work as an engineer and is not able to do so. But he begins working on the rail uh, line and he comes up with an oil drip cup invention. At that time, trains had to stop periodically, maybe around every 20 miles to all the moving parts. Well, he comes with an oil drip cup that meant that the train's parts could be lubricated and not have to stop. And his invention was was so good, people tried to mimic it. But when they bought the competitor, they say, no, 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 no. We want the real McCoy. And so when my father told me the story of Elijah McCoy and how I had heard that phrase, because we still use in this day and age, I said, I want to be a mechanical engineer. Also, that 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 summer, uh, I was blessed to meet um, some older black men who were graduate students at Stanford University. Um, one had done undergrad at NC State uh, in mechanical engineering. And so those two things in the eighth grade let me know that I want to be a mechanical engineer, that I want to go to undergrad at NC State, grad school at Stanford. And that's what I did. And so my sp specific training in grad school was in robotics and vehicle design and worked with an automotive engineer. We were working on the, the early phases of uh, the self-driving car. Um, graduated, then worked for Michelin Tire Company in Greenville, South Carolina at North American headquarters, where basically I was a race car driver. I was the engineer who was responsible for helping the tire designer understand the tire impact on vehicle perform performance. And then also work with automotive companies, BMW, Ford, Chevrolet, Porsche, to, under to help the automotive designer understand how their design can better interact with the tire for optimal vehicle performance. And so I would get into work, um, run simulations on the computer, 
to decrease the amount of uh, bit tire bills you had to build to go from concept to introducing into the market and would do maneuvers in the morning on laptop and then in the afternoon, put on a racing suit and helmet, get in a Porsche and redo those maneuvers. Again, trying to predict because it would take maybe seven iterations. You'd have to design a tire, test it, tweak it, make another one. So seven iterations to go from concept um, into production. And so we wanted to decrease that uh, to maybe three or four steps, uh, which also save money and would, would, would um, move the process forward. So it was in the context of working as an engineer in Greenville, South Carolina, where I seriously took the, the call to ministry. Um, people kept asking me, had I thought about ministry? Obviously I had, but seven years old, this high school senior reaches out to me or tells me this. And after some time in, in the corporate world, entered what we call the Episcopal Church, the discernment process, uh, which is about 18 months, two year process of talking to different individuals and, and focus groups, seeing if they hear this call in me. And uh, they did and went to seminary, resigned from Michelin, went to seminary in New York City at the General Theological Seminary of the Episcopal Church, where I got a Master of Divinity degree after three years. From there, ordination first as a deacon and then as a priest, uh, where I ministered in Dallas, Texas for three years, uh, really as an, an outdoor evangelist. I was in three different areas at uh, Northern Dallas Church, where I was in charge of, of young adult ministry, basically college, I think of ages of 18 to 30. So that demographic, I was in charge of that ministry there. Then I was in Southeast Dallas, a mostly Spanish speaking neighborhood using outdoor worship or outdoor liturgy as means of evangelism as ways of telling the christian story and then i was in south dallas which was all black at a historically black episcopal elementary school grades k through six called saint philip school where i was chaplain uh the miraculous thing about saint philip school that after um students enter middle and high school about half go to public school half go to private school their high school graduation rate for the years of their existence, now 80 years, is 100%. And their college graduation rate is 98%. Uh, in my view, it's proof that, that when you start out early and, and, and bake it in, it, it lasts. And then from there to become rector of St. Ambrose in Raleigh, North Carolina, coming here was coming, uh, almost coming back home. I grew up uh, in Lewisburg, Franklin County, the next county over and went to college at NC State. So I was very familiar with the city, not as familiar with the congregation. Um, I did not attend this church here as a, as a college student. Um, so that's my journey here. And I've been at St. Ambrose now since 2012. So I'm in my 11th year as, as leading this congregation. That's an amazing journey. Now, look, I knew some of that, but now I didn't know about the race car driving. You know, okay, now, now, now I see why you stayed in shape. Okay, okay, you, you didn't mention the martial arts stuff, but that's okay. You know what I'm saying? We told you that, that that's another thing. I mean, wow, but I mean, no, no, okay, knowing that it was Michelin, and you know, and I'm a proud graduate of NC State. You know, so go, so definitely go Wolfpack. You know, here's happy to hear hear about that. But then how even just I, I preach, I didn't know that about the process, of, you know, of having a, that, that discernment process and having some months where you're also talking to other people, and, uh, you know, and yeah. getting clarity from them as well, you know, and getting that input. And then when you go to Texas and it's, it just seems like you worked with so many, um, so many um, age groups. OK, you know, where, where, where you work. So I mean, wow. So you really got a, to me, you, you not only got an education in engineering but you 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 were doing so much with people and you're out there on the grounds inside outside so it's like it was already baked into you and this whole seven-year-old thing it makes me think about my uncle used to always told me when i was you know, he used to always call me real mm -hmm. why do you keep calling me that so I, I i so so we got we got some commonalities there okay but this, this is great okay but then so that leads me now to be honest with you Jamal, to the next yeah. question yeah. i want to ask and, and and i'm still basking in what i learned that day walking around, uh, you know, walking around St. Ambrose and seeing all of the things uh, that, 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 that you were teaching me, which is why we wanted to put the question of a, a specific way. Okay. Knowing that you and your congregation have established, I said it one way here, but established yourself in environmentalism. 
as well as in stewardship. You know, and you've been talking about preaching about this, excuse me, you know, there and of course, activating your personal as well as your professional, you know, or even um, spiritual life in this now. Will you speak with us, please, on the rain gardens there at the church and the other, like the other innovative things that you are doing that is healing? Because I know how I felt when I went through all of the different spaces around the church and how I felt. Okay, so I just wanted to ask that, yeah, like, like, can you know, like, can, can you speak to that and what, like, you know, like, led to, to, to this powerful initiative that you all are doing and, and how you secured the support and funds to, to, you know, to make this work? To understand St. Ambrose present, it's important to look at it through the lens of the past, really this, this Sankofa moment uh, that you have to look back in order to go forward. St. Ambrose was formed in, in 1868, right at the end of the Civil War. Uh, by a gentleman who came from New York City, an Episcopal priest, a white Episcopal priest, who came to Raleigh to found a university that became St. Augustine's University, the historically Black Episcopal University in Raleigh, North Carolina. He founded that to educate those recently emancipated people of African ancestry, just three years after the end of the Civil War. And then he also founded a congregation that eventually became known as St. Ambrose Episcopal Church as a congregation to minister not only to the students of St. Augustine's, but also also to the larger community. In 1868, we built a, a small wooden church, a carpenter Gothic style church in Smoky Hollow. Smoky Hollow was an area where freed black people lived during enslavement. It got its name Smoky Hollow by its proximity to the Raleigh Gaston Railroad Depot. The noxious smoke, train smoke, would float to this low-lying area that was undesirable for white people to live. And so that's where black people live. And so it got the name Smoky Hollow. We don't have um, respiratory data from that time, but it's reasonable to assume that the asthma and other respiratory illnesses were higher in that community because the smoke always was there cloudy. The EPA reported last year that um, African Americans are 34% more likely to suffer from asthma given their proximity um, to areas that are, are not, that don't have the air quality as other areas, uh, mainly being near interstate. And so that, that was our genesis. We were born in environmental racism um, out of environmental racism. And so we were there for 32 years when three things happened. Um, in 1898, a very conservative Democratic Party was elected to the North Carolina General Assembly. And what we saw uh, on January 6th, a few years ago, happened first in Wilmington, North Carolina in 1898 uh, with, with, with the Wilmington riot, where a white supremacist mob goes into the government officials in Wilmington, um, oust the duly elected city council, oust the duly elected mayor, uh, impose their own white supremacist mayor and city council, um, and then proceed to burn the black community. Um, so we have this wave of, of white supremacy um, really tackling the legal system. And so that very conservative General Assembly uh, comes to the state capitol, and then Raleigh follows suit and institutes two color, color lines. Raleigh is unique because most cities, no matter Southern, Northern, doesn't matter, had one color line. Raleigh had two that bisected, not bisected, but were quartered off the city into four quadrants, three where white people could live and work, and one quadrant where black people could live and work. The second thing that happened is that a cotton mill company eyed our church's property because they wanted to build a cotton mill. Think of the irony of that, that um, people who historically have picked cotton during enslavement, African-Americans, build a church, and now a cotton mill wants to build um, on that site. And the General Assembly um, sold our property from under the church. And so in June of 1900, we physically lifted up our wooden church, put it on logs and rolled it a mile south across two color lines to the newly formed black community near Shaw University, uh, the oldest historically black college university in the South, founded 1865, uh, moving us from a white side of town, which is where we were, to the black side of town. Also in at those 32 years, uh, the neighborhood went from a majority black community to a more uh, mill working white uh, community. 
when we read the history from the report given in 1901 to our Dawson Convention, um, the, the archdeacon for colored work, this was the black person responsible for black ministry in the Dawson of North Carolina wrote that the greatest thing St. Ambrose has done in his short history is to physically move the black church closer to black people. And we've done that twice in our history. So we stayed at this second site for about uh, 65 years when um, the city was ready to condemn our building because it was over 100 years old or nearly 100 years old. And so we're saying, where do we want to move? In 1956, the city of Raleigh, the Raleigh City Council, established two intentional Black communities in segregation, uh, during segregation. These are places designated for Black people to live, new communities. One of them became known as Rochester Heights, which is where St. Ambrose currently is located, zoned in 1956. Uh, well, uh, Rochester Heights is uh, beside Walnut Creek and then the Walnut Creek wetland. Uh, a wetland is a low-lying area, part of a watershed, where um, water that is not absorbed into the ground runs into the river and then makes its way to the Atlantic Ocean. The watershed around Walnut Creek is, is 46 square miles. The city of Raleigh began dumping raw sewage into Walnut Creek in 1887, and it dumped sewage for 70 years until 1956, the same year it zoned this area where they dumped raw sewage as a place for black people to live. It also was a de facto dumping ground. It wasn't an official dumping site, um, but people would, would dump items there. And so what I say is that the city dumped sewage, they dumped garbage, and then they dumped black people. And so for the second time in church's history, we decided to physically move our church closer to black people. But instead of building, of moving our, our edifice at that time, because it was um, about to be condemned, we built a, a, a new edifice, new building in Rochester Heights. Because of its proximity to the Walnut Creek wetland, Black people were promised that their homes would not flood. And that didn't happen because their homes flooded. As uh, uh, Thomas, you and I walked on uh, Bailey Drive and I was showing you all of these green lots. And I said, at one point in time, there were 15 houses on these lots. Um, and they were just washed off the foundation. So constant flooding in this black community. And so in 1995, 96, one of our church leaders who um, led our altar guild, this is a group of people who prepare the altar for worship on, on Sunday morning, looked to the rector at that time, the Reverend Arthur Calloway, and said, I'm tired of my home flooding, do something. He tapped a church member named Dr. Norman Camp, uh, one of the first African-Americans uh, to re receive a, a advanced degree PhD from North Carolina State University, tapped him, who was an environmentalist from the neighborhood, and started a group that was called initially Episcopalians for Environmental Justice. And we partnered with two other Episcopal congregations, um, one 15 miles away, one 30 miles away. And we realized that we needed to broaden our scope. And so we changed the name to Partners for Environmental Justice, PEJ, that group exists today, and worked with corporations and other nonprofits and as well as governments, uh, government entities to form uh, this collaborative, collaborative effort. One of the first things we did is that we started cleaning up the wetlands. We pulled out uh, tires, hundreds of tires pulled out of the wetland. We pulled out mattresses, um, uh, headboards from beds. We pulled out, out an autoclave. You know, an autoclave is a, um, an, a sterilization piece of equipment that you find on college campuses. You, you don't have an autoclave in your house because it's used to sterilize instruments. It's the size of maybe one or two refrigerators. All of these things being pulled out of the wetlands. Um, and 2009 was was really a, a year of celebration because that's when we opened a, a $2 million education center, the Walnut Creek Wetland Center, which now bears the name of Dr. Norman and Betty Camp Educational Center. Um, we, we did the ribbon cutting for that in 2009, um, LEED certified building, partnership with NC State that um, sees hundreds of community members a year who come to see the beauty of the wetland. The wetland is, is unique in that we have a number of, of wildlife 
um, and plant life that you really don't find anywhere else, uh, some would say, uh, in the world. We have lamprey fish, which are saltwater, freshwater fish that swim from the Atlantic up uh, freshwater um, the river and to lay eggs in Walnut Creek and then return to the ocean. We have mink as in um, uh, mink coat. When we did a capital campaign a few years ago, one of my church members who's always trying to be a joke, she said, Father Taylor, we don't need a capital campaign. Just let, let's, let's, just let us hunt for some mink and we could sell mink and make a lot of money. I said, we're not going to do that because we're not going to do that to God's creatures. But we have mink that live here. We have our great blue heron. We have uh, ruby uh, breasted uh, hummingbirds, any number of, of plant that when, when the um, uh, Brimley brothers came in the late 1800s, these um, English botanists, they came to Walnut Creek and cultivated or found plant life that they sent to museums all over the world. Uh, because of the uniqueness of, that was found here. But anyway, we started uh, Partners for Environmental Justice. We built the Education Center uh, in 2014. We worked to get $1 million on a $92 million bond, park bond, to move it from a five-acre center to a 56-acre park, more protected space. Um, and so when we think about St. Ambrose and environmentalism, we, we deal with flooding, we, we've dealt with uh, air quality, we deal with noise pollution, because we had the DOT uh, bisect two black communities, Rochester Heights and Biltmore Hills, by putting um, Interstate 40 right, right between us. The same thing happened in New York City, Robert Moses Cross Bronx Expressway, uh, the decimation of black communities uh, through infrastructure. Um, and so when you talk, when you talk about the things that we do, how to understand the, what we've done now is through the lens of that history. And so if I speak specifically about the number of environmental things outside of PEJ, we believe that we need to be in good relationship with the environment. Um, Christians talk about sin, which is, which means being in wrong relationship. Uh, being in a relationship that that's not right. So out, out of step in relationship with God, with humanity and with the environment. Um, and so when we look at what's happened around Walnut Creek and Walnut Creek wetlands, we really see this from a Christian standpoint as a sin against the environment. And so we as a Christian congregation are working for transformation, restoration, resurrection of this area. And so we are always trying to increase our ecological footprint. Um, one of the things we did in 2016 is that we launched a capital campaign with an ecological, uh, that was ecologically focused. And so we installed low E, low emissivity uh, windows outside of our complete envelope of the church, which um, decreases the amount of emissivity that comes into the church. And so during the summer, it makes it cooler. Uh, and in the winter, it makes it warmer. So it, so it decreases our um, energy usage. We completely revamped our water system. So now we use 80% less water. Um, we install water fountains to decrease the number of, of uh, bottled water that we use. Uh, we put in LED lights. We um, increase the ampage on our HVAC systems, which means we actually uh, consume less energy. And then external to the building, we install several rain gardens that take water from the roof, from the parking lot and the street, that polluted water, that polluted water is made up of gasoline, um, tire, rubber, whatever is on the street. Uh, the rain garden collects that in something that is um, aesthetically pleasing. So not just a retention pond, but in this, this uh, garden that allows water to be soaked into the earth. And that water that's soaked into the earth does not run into Walnut Creek. So it, it serves as a barrier of polluted water to Walnut Creek. So we have three rain gardens. We have uh, two 1,000 gallon cisterns. So 2,000 gallons worth of cistern space that collects water from our roof. And we use that for, for drip line irrigation. We've built um, 
three new structures that are completely pervious. One is a prayer garden with a columbarium where we inter uh, urns, where people are cremated, completely um, a permeable surface there. Um, and then we installed an Ethiopian inspired labyrinth that is both ADA compliant and again, completely permeable, serving almost as a rain garden, um, soaking up water that uh, would roll into, run into Walnut Creek, is now absorbed into the ground. When the city did a study of our soil, they described our soil as baseball field grade, because one of the things about baseball field is that you wanted to absorb rain quickly because you got to stop the game. You see, you know, uh, Major League Baseball, they're, they're pulling out the the, the tarp because they don't want to grab, they don't want the field to get wet. But they described our our property, our the dirt here as baseball grade dirt because the absorption rate is so high. We absorb water on our property at a higher rate than engineers said than almost any place that, that, that they've seen. Um, and then our newest initi initiative, it's called the, the Healing Pod, which is a healing garden where we use therapeutic horticulture as a way of addressing the mental and emotional health needs of the larger community. When, we, when I think about this, new, this effort, I think about my time at St. Ambrose. When I came to St. Ambrose, Dr. Camp, the environmentalist walked me around the property telling me the history and I just could not believe it from dumping sewage to saying black people had to li live here to really the degradation of the environment. And as I was walking with him, I envisioned four stages. One was a stage that is, I would call pristine. This was before European engagement, um, a time when um, the First Nations people, the, the, the Tuscarora, the Catawba, we're here and in right relationship with the environment. The second phase is really European engagement, the dumping of sewage, uh, the degradation of the wetland. The third phase is the phase of zoning for black people to live here and the black community helping bring back the health of the wetland. And I feel we're entering the fourth phase where this restored environment is helping to heal the black community. Coming out of the pandemic, one of the things that became evident is a need for greater e uh, mental and emotional health. And so again, we are using at this point, therapeutic horticulture, but we want to move into the space uh, where we use horticultural therapy as again, as a way of using or uh, working with the environment to bring mental and emotional healing to the community, because we know that in participating in the life cycle of plants, the planting, uh, the pruning, the weeding, it helps people deal with their own emotional health. Uh, one of the reasons is that there is no shame associated with that. Um, many times when people are going through any number of emotional or, or mental health events, Shame comes from another human being. There is judgment. And that is just not good for overall health. When you are engaging with plants, taking care of plants, there is no judgment. Um, and so, again, that's one of the other things when we look at therapeutic horticulture and horticulture therapy that is, is beneficial in engaging the environment. We also know that being in nature is good for people. Uh, one of the things that we also are looking at, um, we are in a a pretty wooded area. We are urban. We're only a half mile to a mile from the city center, uh, and we're in a wetland. So it's 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 it, it feels like we're a little bit rural, yet we're in an, an urban environment. How do we engage our our tree canopy? Because we know, particularly from Eastern thought, the Japanese have done a lot of uh, work and research on this as it relates to to tree bathing. We know that being under tree canopy in nature is good for your health. Um, it decreases blood pressure, brings down the, the heart rate, um, uh, bringing, uh, breathing in the air, of course, is, is good for the lungs. So we, we see this over the next, uh, you know, five to 10 years is really growing uh, the healing pod, this healing garden as, as a way of not only meeting the emotional and mental health needs of the community, um, but also just the physical health as well. I'm just blown away. Okay. Like I look, Bennett, this is just how it is when you're in this presence. Okay. 
sit, you can talk. I mean, you can talk anything. You can talk Avengers, Matrix, but then you can talk science. And it is beautiful because you're just like, this is my friend and I'm learning at the same time. You know, I mean, those four phases, brother. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Have you been enjoying the episodes of the Heartwood Podcast? Do you like the topics that we discuss? If you are interested in going deeper, we encourage you to get the book written by our own Dr. Thomas Rashard Easley, Mind Heart for Diversity. And you can purchase the book from our website, mindheartfordiversity.com. Thank you. You know, I mean, those four phases, brother. Thank you. Just thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Even though you share some tough things. You know, and, uh, you know, but you shared a very, as you always do, you know, very, very, very um, eloquently. But those four phases, I, I like to ask you something, right? Because uh, it feels like we're, as you mentioned, going to coming into the fourth phase. But are there any practices that you do while stewarding that land that you think are unique to the community in the area or to the Black community along yes. the coast. And, you know, and if so, where do some of those come from? You already know, like you were teaching me about some of the plants growing under the trees the last time we were together and educated me on, you know, yucca and everything. So, but that's, you know, if you want to share that, but I know you got plenty more to share. A great, great question. When I think about maybe customs or practices that, that are unique to our context, I, I can speak to St. Ambrose and more so my ministry. And one of the things that we do whenever we are going to do anything in nature to break ground on a rain garden is that we, we bless it with holy water. But we also do this tradition that we get from the church in the Philippines. So the Episcopal Church is, is around the world, and we have a relationship with the church, the Episcopal Church in the, in the Philippines. They have this service called the planting of the cross. And so what we do is we take the cross from Palm Sunday, Holy Week, Palm Sunday to Easter Sunday is the most sacred time in the Christian year. And traditionally, um, in many liturgical churches, um, there's the palms, the, the palm fronds, the waving of the palms, um, singing Hosanna. Also, some people take the, the palm fronds and they fold and make a cross out of it. The cross may be about three inches tall and, and maybe two inches wide. And so this service, we actually plant the palm cross as a way of asking God to bless the land. And so when we look at the, the rain garden that we've done, when we look at the, the, the courtyard, uh, the prayer garden, each, each time we broke ground, there was the blessing of the holy water, the holy water to bless the ground, and then the planting of the palm cross. So that's been something that that's unique to, to this space, uh, this place. Um, I, I remember picking up this tradition while in seminary in New York City, used it in Dallas, Texas, when we were doing a community garden, and then then brought brought that here. Again, taking um, a, a, a celebratory symbol, the palms from Palm Sunday, and then planting it, asking that, asking God to to bless the earth through that. And I just want to add on. You hear about so many different, so many traditions from around the world where, uh, while you're doing something, you're giving back. It's not just right. one way. It's it's about right. giving back and making sure that it's healing in both ways. That is a way to to give back in the Christian tradition. The palms for Palm Sunday are blessed and they are burned on Mardi Gras or Fat Tuesday, the day before Ash Wednesday. And that's where the ashes for Ash Wednesday come from. And so, again, the, nothing is lost. It's 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 recycled that the palms are burned ashes for, for that holy time. And in this case, we take some of the palms and we return it to the earth as ask as a sign of God's blessing on the land. You thank you, thank you for like you know just everything like so much that you shared. I could ask you questions about the impact you think of uh, 1868, talking about the Rivington Rise of 1898. I mean, like you, you brought up so many powerful things that I think people uh, hopefully will go back and Google or research, you know, and, and take take from that. But you've also uh, since you've been there at uh, 
at us, St. Ambrose, you've also not only been engaged in supporting the community, you know, by helping with the Wetland Creek Center, but you've also been having to be engaged in your own activism. Uh, and really supporting, uh, you know, at least when you, like you mentioned, when you walked me through the community and showed me, and I remember the shock on my face, when you were like, there was a house there. And I'm like, wait, what? You know, and then we pulled out the map. And I mean, there were more than three plots were houses. And I was like, I, I've heard this, but I've never seen a house washed away. And I know that recently, or at least I, I don't want to say I know I've recently learned that, you know, in the last couple of years, you have had to really stand up with the community. I want to say for but with, because that's how you do it. I know as a partnership, as a brother, brotherhood, a sisterhood, and familyhood. But will you share about a recent event where you and the church had to stand with the community to protect homes, to protect livelihoods, to protect, to really just protect the lives of you all and the neighbors where, where you're based? One of the things that St. Ambrose um, is that we believe in the theology of parish, uh, P-A-R-I-S-H, that your theology must match your geography. Uh, when people hear church, they think of a building, an edifice. Uh, church is made up of people. Parish um, is not about a church building, but about geography. The only place you really find that in the United States is when you think about Louisiana, you know, they talk about parishes instead of counties. So in that context, they have lived into this idea of, of church and geography. And so I view St. Ambrose Parish, St. Ambrose Episcopal Church, where I am, I view the neighborhood as my parish. And so I have people in the community who don't go to church or go to different churches. It doesn't matter. Uh, I, I, I am their priest. And some, some people see me out and about and say, this is my priest. I say, well, I didn't think you were Episcopalian. They say, well, I'm not, but you know, father Taylor is my priest. And so there is this, this, this marriage between church and the surrounding community, this idea that your theology has to match your geography. And so two things that I'll, that I'll speak about, um, I chair Raleigh stormwater commission. The name of it is, um, Stormwater Management Advisory Commission. The acronym is SMAC. I think it's one of the best acronyms you have out there. So I chair SMAC. And the reason I got on SMAC is that SMAC is the entity that oversees about a $12 million budget that puts forward um, um, development changes, code changes that deal with stormwater runoff. So when developers build, when the new buildings go up, what are the stormwater implications? And when I looked at the, when I looked at SMAC, I did not see a lot of diversity. Uh, I saw uh, mostly white men who did not live in Southeast Raleigh. And yet they were making impacts and making decisions that impact the Southeast Raleigh, because guess what? Water runs downstream and North Raleigh <laughs> is North of Southeast Raleigh. And so what happens up there impacts me down here. And I uh, had the, the mayor appointed me to SMAC. And um, two years ago, I was elected a co chair. And I, I'm now in my second year as chairing um, the Raleigh Stormwater Commission. That talks about advocacy, that talks about ministry. And this is not foreign to the, to the Black ministry experience in, in the United States, where the minister, the Black minister, is more than preacher in the pulpit. That black minister, by and large, is seen as as integral in the community by those who are not religious at all. Um, and so sometimes when when people talk with me, they say, well, what do your church members think about the fact that, you know, you chair this Raleigh Stormwater Commission? I said, well, they think it's great. Uh, my predecessor was a two term city council member. So you had a city council member who was rector of a congregation, that type of engagement thing, you know, Adam Clayton Powell, senior and junior is, is not foreign um, um, for, for people to hold a religious office and to hold government office, at least in, in the in the black tradition as a way of of making the community better. And so one of the things I'm proud of is that um, on my, on, from on my time as smack, we have uh, passed any number of uh, more stringent building requirements, meaning that when building happens, that uh, stormwater has to be protected in, in a certain way um, so that it decreases the runoff, which brings me to downtown South. 
in August of 2020, pandemic hits March of 2020, August 2020, I find myself in a Zoom meeting. I'm listening to a developer, one of the largest developers in the Southeast, not Southeast North Carolina, Southeast United States. In a, listening to his corporation give a presentation about building a 150 acre development, a half mile upstream from St. Ambrose, straddling Walnut Creek. I heard a developer talk about raising, so cutting down 80 acres of forestry in order to build um, a, a, a 20,000 seat stadium, soccer stadium, in order to build uh, three hotels, office buildings, um, luxury uh, apartments, uh, luxury condos, 3,000 feet upstream from Walnut Creek. You do not have to be a stormwater engineer to realize that if you take 150 acres and pave it, that rainwater has to go somewhere. It's going to go into Walnut Creek. And it's going to go into an already flood prone area. Around that same time, uh, St. Ambrose was instrumental in starting a new industrial areas foundation, IAF, Community Organizing Power Group. Um, I was introduced to IAF while living in New York City, particularly in uh, the, the work I was doing in Brooklyn. And I saw how community organizing helped transform the Bronx in Brooklyn to, to make it uh, the, the communities that exist today from burned out uh, apartment buildings in the late 70s into these marvelous living situations now. And so in, in 2016, we started a conversation about community organizing, about bringing that uh, to Raleigh, the capital city and the capital county. After four years of building relationship, we launched in uh, 2020. And the first thing we took on was downtown South, this development that was larger than Raleigh's downtown. Um, uh, and so when I was sitting in this meeting, the stormwater part of the presentation said there would be no downstream flooding impact from this development, which made no sense and simply was not true. We organized. We spent the next 90 days meeting with the developer, talking to community members, meeting with our elected officials. And a week before Christmas, uh, December 17, 2020, um, in the final draft that was voted on by the council, what started off as basically fewer than 10 words, there's no downstream impact, morphed into a 100, a 1500 word document describing how um, the stormwater implications, that they had to keep the majority of stormwater on site. They had to use green stormwater infrastructure, had to use the, the, the best technology to control what I call the two Vs, um, water volume, so the amount of water, and water velocity, the speed of water. Those two, those two Vs really impact flooding. And in addition to that, we want a community benefit agreement, a, CB, a CBA, where from the coffers of the developer, uh, they would start a two and a half million dollar grant matching fund. So it can it can be up to five million dollars, but two and a half million dollar grant matching fund for six flood prone areas downstream off site for the development to help deal with um, flood mitigation. We also had considerations for housing and workforce, affordable housing and workforce development that were a part of, of the agreement. Those were, were not as strong. Uh, we were not able to get the wins on affordable housing and workforce development with this project. But as it related to stormwater, it was, it was a, a hum, humongous win. And so we stood with the community because again, this church is an integral part of the community. I remember having a conversation with a, a minister friend of mine, a, a rector of the Episcopal Church in a neighboring city. This Episcopal Church shares a parking lot with um, another church in a different tradition, a non-Episcopal Church, and a funeral home. All three of these are Black organizations, Black Episcopal, Black Other Church, and Black Funeral Home. And so the pastor of the, of the 
the non-Episcopal church, the, the, the Episcopal rector asked the other pastor, you know, if our church ceased to exist, do you think the community would notice? The non-Episcopal pastor looked at this person and said, you know what? They wouldn't notice at all, uh, which is really a sad commentary. We view St. Ambrose as being so integral to this community that if we cease to exist, not only with the community that where the community miss us, but also uh, the city as well. And so we're so intertwined with the fabric of Rochester Heights of Southeast Raleigh that we really stood with the residents here as a way of preventing flooding because flooding happens. When I talk about um, the environmental impact in Southeast Raleigh, we acknowledge climate change exists, no question. And climate change is not our biggest issue right now. What our biggest issue is, is what I call non-climate stressors. This is the development of property in this 46 square mile watershed. Because whenever buildings go up and pavement goes over ground, that means that water is not soaked into the ground and comes right past uh, my church, St. Ambrose. And I've been here 11 years. And just by eyeballing, I can see that the standing water level is moving closer and closer to St. Ambrose, which is built in the floodplain. Not because we wanted to build in the floodplain, but because when we approached the city in the 60s about building a church in this new black community, uh, they said, if you want to build, you have to build here and point it to the map. And we said, OK, that's that's where um, we will build. And so we, we, what's also frustrating about um, when we think about flooding and stormwater is that our governing body, the General Assembly for the state of North Carolina legislative body, um, right around Valentine's Day in 2019, passed a bill that makes it illegal for municipalities to regulate stormwater over existing property. So for examples, if um, there is a new building downtown and it's completely impervious, it's, it's it's paved over, no water soaks into the ground. And in the redevelopment of that property, um, we wanted to require more stringent um, stormwater uh, st uh, storm metrics. That's illegal. If it was 100% impervious before, it has to remain 100% impervious unless the developer wants, out of the goodness of the developer's heart, to do more stormwater requirements. Um, and so that's frustrating because the city, uh, which SMAC, the Stormwater Management Advisory Commission, passed, um, the, the, the city's uh, UDO, as it relates to stormwater, is excellent. And yet our impact is only on city properties because we're not able to regulate corporations. The beautiful thing about this Downtown South project is because of the community outcry, the developer adopted the city's more stringent requirements on its property and applied it to this corporate property, which is extraordinarily unusual. So as you see, he, he you know, everyone listening, it's so much that I can say about him. I mean, you, you had to stand with the community, but you really understand your role and your position as well as your positionality in doing this work, but you also understood what was going on from the other side of the, of the developer's mindset, the inconsistencies with, with uh, you know, saying that there won't be any downstream impact. And, you know, that's why when you said that, I'm going to mute everyone, but I'm like looking at them like, really, like, how's that going to happen? But then the fact that you had to spend so much time, like you said, 90 days after there's one thing you had to do, you had to keep going. And it's taken months and, of course, a couple of years to get them to the point where they did, of course, stop and did not move in there. But you can still see water rising and that can still impact the church as well as the community if some other things don't don't change. Yeah. And so, you know, with that, you know, uh, to me, I mean, I still hear the story of victory, but it's like with victory that always comes the opportunity of something else. So it's like you have to stay vigilant and stay and stay ahead. You know, a father tell I had like a couple other questions here, but I think I want to ask you. I probably want just want to you and I maybe just kind of talking about it just more like as a friend. Like one, I see that you're doing a lot. You know, I say I'm not gonna put all your business out there in the world because you got so much going on personally and all of that. I mean, positive things. But how are you? You know, the fact that you're leading this congregation 
as well as family, you know, and taking care of yourself. I mean, you look amazing, but you always do, you know, but how are you and how do you, you know, I, I think that that's important. You as a man, you as a friend, you as a brother, not just as a father and a father, you know, but like, how are you and what do you do to take care of yourself or to, uh, you know, to rejuvenate and to keep yourself moving and during this work? Because I, I, I don't say it like I know, but I know it's not easy. So that, that's a good that's a good question. Um, when, when you and I met not too long ago, I just come off sabbatical and I was blessed to take a three month sabbatical and uh, my family, my spouse, as well as my two young children. I have a, a three year old daughter and one year old son spent two months traveling. We were in Ethiopia for one month. Ethiopia is, is important to me because I inst I study what I call indigenous African Christianity. This is Christianity on the continent of Africa before the engagement of European slave traders and colonialists. It is Christianity without the yoke of white supremacy. I, I use this phrase uh, wrapped in righteousness. Um, this this idea that Western Christianity uh, can be wrapped in righteousness, that that we're chasing purity and connecting it to the European ideal that what is white is right. And yet when you engage Ethiopia, you're, you're engaged in uh, Christianity that is very ancient. So we were there in Ethiopia for the two um, highest holy days, not necessarily the holy days, but the two biggest celebrations, uh, Christmas, their Orthodox Christmas, January 7th, and then Epiphany, which is their largest, from a number standpoint, religious celebration on January 19th. Um, I call it a, a carnival for Christ. And so we were there in Ethiopia for about a month. And from there, we went to Trinidad and Tobago. And we happened to be there for carnival itself. So we went from a carnival of Christ to carnival Carnival goes without saying. We were there for two weeks. And then after that, we went to Jamaica uh, for two weeks. And so what we were doing is I wrote I wrote um, uh, and received a grant from the Lilly Foundation, the Lilly Endowment, uh, which I call Endeavors in Ethiopian Spirituality. So we're retracing um, the journey of Ethiopian Christianity as it moved west. Um, we know it was, it was uh, his imperial majesty, Haile Selassie, I, um, who commissioned a number of Ethiopian archbishops to go to the Western Hemisphere to engage um, people in the African diaspora in Ethiopian Christianity. And so the first place that um, uh, one of the archbishops went was Trinidad and Tobago. And so the first um, Ethiopian church establishment outside of Ethiopia was in Trinidad. And then from there, one of the famous bishops, um, Archbishop Abuna Yeshak, um, who baptized Bob Marley. That's another conversation. And I was, I was also there for Bob Marley's birthday um, in, in, in February. Abuna Yeshak goes to um, Jamaica, where he spends 40 years, four decades, um, evangelizing and founding and establishing the Ethiopian church. And so the, the, the largest Ethiopian Orthodox presence in the Caribbean is in Jamaica. And so I reach, we retraced those footsteps in Ethiopia, then Trinidad and Tobago, and then uh, winding out our time in, in Ethiopia. Uh, family loved it. If you ask my daughter to highlight, it was having breakfast with Cookie Monster and Elmo in Jamaica. Um, and dance with them on stage. I mean, she loved that. Um, uh, she also loved uh, being in Ethiopia. Uh, one, of, one of those kind of proud father moments was when we were on the Nile River. So the, for, the, the, the source of the Blue Nile is in Ethiopia. Uh, Blue Nile, White Nile meet in Khartoum, Sudan, and you get the Nile from there. So we're, we're on a boat on the Blue Nile River. And my daughter says, Nile, is that Moses? That's right, daughter. You got you made that connection. Yeah, the same now, Moses. That that's this right here. Um, so just a wonderful time to reconnect, to uh, relax. Uh, two months of travel, one month of just doing nothing for the month of March uh, at home, um, hanging out with my my kids and uh, doing doing some cooking and other things. So that was help. That that helped to 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 underscore the importance of Sabbath and rest um, in my life. And so I always believe that if my well is empty, then I cannot serve others. And so I have a number of practices that that I think are, are essential. Um, of course, being a person of faith, uh, having prayer 
um, and make sure my relationship with God is strong. Um, I am a, a huge proponent of therapy um, so that we can better understand what's happening with our uh, unconscious. And so I spend spend time um, with a therapist. I have a spiritual director, a spiritual mentor to help me see, to look at my life through the, through the lens of, of the gospel. Um, I do a spiritual a silent spiritual retreat each year, going to a monastery, a convent, or a retreat center as a time of prayer and restoration, and just try to draw those those boundaries of rest, uh, making sure I take my Sabbath, you know, at least one day off during the week, and um, working on leaving work at work, leaving ministry. At, at work, realizing that there are those times when I do receive a call at three in the morning that, you know, someone has passed and I have to go and give last rites or near passing or go visit people in the hospital, um, knowing that those things will happen and not letting uh, my ministry consume me because my first vow and important relationship is to God. Uh, and the second is to my family, which is my spouse and my children. And then church comes after that. Um, and many times ministers can get it reversed and actually put church ahead of God so that such that church becomes God um, and then they lose their relationship with God. Look, I, I think that we, in this episode, sir, got not only a lesson, I think we got a seminary course. I think we got a self-care, well, wealth, health, wait a minute, health, well-being course. I think you got a history course. I definitely think that we got a lot of black love, uh, the black brilliance, intelligence, but no, just take the, just intelligence and brilliance. I mean, it's so much, Jamal, I'm sitting over here just like I'm trying to maintain because I'm in the public space, but I'm really just, it's like I'm doing backflips inside. Because even though you definitely said a lot of challenging things, you know, you've also shared with us victorious ways that you address them. You've continued as, uh, as I know your congregation, but giving me hope because that, you know, there are individuals like yourself who care, who put their bodies, their, their life, their livelihood, you know, on the line to, to actually do this work because you understand that it's part, you know, it's, it, it is your calling. It is, and you are part of the community. Community is, is a part of you. So I thank you, one, for your time. <laughs> Two, I thank you for your brilliance and sharing that with us. But three, I also thank you for the courage and the accepting of the call uh, to step into this. Because because it's one thing to be called, it's another thing to actually take it and say, yes, I'm going to do it and not run from it. And you have walked into it and still bring that NC State engineering, you know, like North Carolina, brilliant man on in, you know. So, uh, so with that, I just want to ask, is there any other thing that, that, that you'd like to share? Because you, you, you shared a lot. You definitely answered our questions, but you talked about. The EIJ. You've talked about engineering. You've talked about environmental justice, environmentalism. You've talked about, and I say more importantly, you've talked about God and how God is a center of your life, but also our lives, just and your family and yourself and your health and wealth. You know, is there anything else that you would really teach us and bless us with that, uh, you know, before we close out? Appreciate that this time. I know um, you're a student of hip hop. I'm a student of hip hop. If you ask my congregation, I'm I'm quoting you know a rapper at least once once a month uh, during Holy Week. I, I feature Tupac and Childish Gambino um, all in the same week. Um, I know you have a, a hip hop name. Sometimes people call me me Father MC. But if, if there were this, this closing image, um, uh, Dr. Daniel White Hodge, who is um, a Christian, he's a theologian, is university professor. He wrote a book on entitled Homeland and Security about the missiology of hip hop. And one of the chapters of that is called Baptized in Dirty Water, which he's he's quoting the rapper David Banner uh, because he he wrote an album, Baptized in Dirty Water. He calls um, being baptized in dirty water as living in the reality. And it's 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 not sacred. It's not secular. It is it's the mix of both. And if I had to describe my ministry, it is one of uh, being baptized in dirty water, that we have to move out of the walls of the church and get into the world, uh, that the world is a, a murky place. The world is a dangerous place. The, the world also is a very beautiful place. And we have to live at, at the intersection 
and pull down this divide, this false divide of the the sacred and the profane and realize that it just is what it is. It's it's dirty water. Um, and I think it's it's beautiful. And I, I consider it an honor that I minister in the space of dirty water, um, bringing people uh, to the symbolic waters of baptism. Um, I've talked about environmental racism and how it has enacted itself, this flood of environmental racism over, over the levy of history, but it doesn't have to stop there. And that we as Christians believe in resurrection. Um, and at St. Ambrose, we believe that we, we preach this message of resurrection, not just to human beings, but to all of creation. Oh, I really appreciate the resurrection story that we find in Mark's gospel, where Jesus says, go into all of the cosmos, go into all of the created order and proclaim the good news. So just not to people, but to the Walnut Creek wetlands, to bring restoration, um, to bring transformation and to make a difference. So I'm honored to, to be on this podcast and thank you for the opportunity just to tell a little bit of my story. I'm very thankful to have you. You have definitely brought some restoration as well as resurrection here to the Hardwood Podcast. And I would uh, be remiss if I just didn't check in with my brother, make sure that he didn't have anything. So, hey, what's going on, my friend? Sure. Nah, this is this is a sensational interview. I've just been learning so much. Like you said before, it's such a wide range of topics. And yeah, I'm just blessed to be here too. See, yeah, you, you see why I was so excited to talk to him. Remember, I, I got the Father Taylor. When I left you that day, I called Bennett. Like, I'm talking literally, I was like, hey, listen here. We got to move on this, man. We got to get him on here right now. I said, that's <laughs> not, why I said, we got to get him on here now. <laughs> And he moved with me. Oh, he's okay, Doc. All right. Uh, well, then we'll do it. I'll send an email. I mean, I just thank you again. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. I really do hope that you, I know you learned a lot, but I also hope that you learned, enjoyed, you know, uh, something challenged you that you were convicted, you know, to actually do something. Uh, if something touched your spirit and touched your mind that it made you, you know, want to do something. And so we really do appreciate you. And as we close out, I just want to ask, do you do any, um, you know, so I know the answer, but I just want to ask you though for everybody. Do you do social media? Is there where people can reach out to you, Father Taylor? You know, and, you know, follow you online if they just, you know, want to catch up with you. Of course, I know you have a website, but is there any, you know, other way? Definitely. You can learn more at my website, uh, jemond.com, J-E-M-O-N-D-E.com. You can also check out my podcast. I guess I'm pumping my podcast on your podcast, uh, the, the, the Wading Deep podcast, uh, wherever you get your podcast, you search Wading Deep and you'll find that where we talk about the history of environmental racism in Raleigh and how St. Ambrose has responded and it the topics are even broader broader than raleigh so look at the website mm -hmm. check out the podcast thank you sir all right okay everyone hope you got that okay we just we just got a lovely shout out we're going to be checking it out and uh father taylor as we do sometimes man we love to have people come back because i just think you have so much you know more to share so please we'll uh, talk to you and see if you'd be open to that i know our listeners would love to hear from you again but uh I, truistically yeah. i would too uh, and, and i know yes. Benny would too so with that i want to say thank you everybody tuning in this is another illustrious or as Benny said sensational episode of the Hardwood Podcast. We just finished talking to Father Jamon Taylor, my brother, Mr. Ben Lupo, your host, other host, Dr. Thomas Rashad Deasley. Thank you all for being here. Going grace, going peace. Till next time we see each other, take care. Peace. <laughs>